So for CCMP route, um, mo uh, module number one, lesson number two, uh, we're just going to talk about so, a couple of different things in this particular lesson. We're going to start off by talking about different uh, types of traffic that we might see in the network. Uh, something actually that um, I think will make a whole lot of sense when we go through it. Not a, not a really complicated topic. Uh, but then we're going to talk about uh, different types of IPv6 addresses and that might be something unique uh, and new to you guys because you may not have had a whole lot of exposure outside of what you've learned in CCNA, for example, with IPv6. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. We'll also take a look at some different network types and what is the impact of, say, an MBMA network on our routing protocols? Uh, specifically, MBMA uh, in a sense that it stands for non-broadcast multi-access. Uh, there's a reason why a non-broadcast multi-access network might have a negative impact on how routing works and it's uh, essentially how uh, based on the the way that routing protocols form their adjacencies and the types of messages that routers use to form their adjacencies and then we'll uh, finally talk about how the internet breaks enterprise routing uh, primarily well I don't know that it necessarily breaks it it just makes it more difficult to pass traffic all right so let's start by uh, uh, talking about kind of really a basic concept which is what are different network traffic types unicast I think that's the one that uh, everybody is most familiar with very easy to understand unicast essentially means one-to-one -one communication uh, the traffic is sourced from an individual host and it's being sent to an individual host maybe within my broadcast domain or maybe outside of my broadcast domain, but it's a one-to-one -one communication model. Multicast, on the other hand, is a one-to-many communication model where the traffic is being sourced from an individual source, but it's being sent to multiple destinations at the same time. Not in, as individual datagrams, but as a single datagram uh, being sent to a specific packet address space that those uh, hosts subscribe to. And in IPv4, that's going to be the 224.0.0.0 through 239.255.255.255 address block that's reserved for uh, multicast in IPv4. And anything that starts with FF in IPv6 is multicast. All right, so we'll call this. Uh, the FF00 double colon slash uh, six, 16 uh, address block. All right. So anything that starts with FF is going to be IPv, uh, excuse me, multicast in IPv6. <clears throat> now there's a, there are a couple of different ways we distinguish multicast in IPv6 uh, based on scope and um, whether or not it's a well-known multicast address or a uh, what we call a globally unique multicast address or a locally administered multicast address. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. All right. Now, another concept in, in, the, in the realm of addressing is something called Anycast. Anycast is a concept that was introduced in IPv6. Uh, and essentially what we do is we assign uh, this address to an interface on more than one device within the network that's providing a similar service within that network. So let's say, for example, I've got DNS servers in my enterprise in IPv6. I want to go ahead and assign all of my DNS servers an Anycast IPv6 address. And that Anycast IPv6 address, which is actually comes out of what we call the global unicast address space block, that is going to be uh, a single address that um, that the clients that are running the same service will then be assigned, right? When a packet <clears throat> gets routed or gets sent from a client to an Anycast address, let's say, for example, it's a client that's doing a DNS query, it gets routed to the nearest interface that has that particular address. That nearest interface is going to be found based on, you know, how we traditionally send traffic to a destination, whether it's based on a metric, a particular routing protocol, or whatever. All the 
devices in the network that share the same address provide essentially the same type of service in the network. Uh, a, it could be an FTP server, it could be a DNS server, uh, it could be a, well, essentially any kind of server that's going to provide a common service. The most common uh, use case for this anycast type of traffic is a DNS server. Now there's a, obviously a little bit more involved when we're dealing with anycast from the perspective of how do we pick the closest host and, and uh, how is it that a, a single global unicast address, which is now allocated as an anycast address, can exist on different subnets and different broadcast domains. Uh, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of this particular class. But we will see that uh, maybe a little bit later on. I might get into some more details on that. All right. Uh, broadcast, of course, it's any kind of address that uh, we send traffic to uh, that allows us to communicate to multiple hosts at the same time. And there are essentially two different types of broadcast that exist in IPv4 networks. There's a subnet directed broadcast, which is the IP address, the last IP address in any subnet or there's an all hosts broadcast, um, which is the 255, 255, 255, 255 address. Uh, now, that broadcasts themselves are not routable. So the reality is, even though we say it's all hosts, it's the all host broadcast address, the reality is that um, it, it's still local to the subnet because routers never, ever forward broadcasts. Uh, there's never an instance where you can actually get a router to actually forward a broadcast. It, it can simply uh, proxy or relay that information. All right. Now, there are some other multicast addresses that I want to make note of here. Uh, and I do want to point out a couple of other things about multicast. Uh, it's in your book as well on page 23. But uh, I want to just kind of make a quick note. Uh, and I'll put this in in Notepad if you guys aren't uh, following along in the book. Uh, and uh, for RIP, uh, well, let's start at the beginning of the numbers, right? OSPF version 2, which is for IPv4. Uh, it has two different multicast addresses, 224.0.0.5. That's for all OSPF routers. I wasn't even close. Uh, and then we have... Um, 224.0.0.6, which is all OSPF designated routers or backup designated routers. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'll just get rid of the all here because yeah. let's do that to OSPF routers, OSPF DRs. All right. Uh, now, the equivalent to that for OSPF V3. Uh, in this context, I'm mentioning OSPF v3 as a, um, specifically as a, uh, as the IPv6 version of OSPF, FF02 double colon 5 and FF02 double colon 6 respectively. Okay. Uh, for RIP, RIP version 2, because RIP version 1 uses 255, 255, 255, 255, it's going to be 224.0.0.9. And for RIP next generation, which is the equivalent for IPv6, FF02 double colon 9, uh, you can start to see a similarity already. EIGRP 224.0.0.10. And uh, for IPv6, FF. 02 double colon A. All right. There are a couple of others that I'll mention real quick, uh, which I think are important to note, um, even though they're not in the table in your book. F224.0.0.1 uh, .0 or FF02 double colon 1, all hosts. And actually, eh, well, we'll see if that certainly exists in in uh, IPv4, I mean IPv6, and by the way, the scope here might change depending on which host you're trying to communicate to, uh, 224.0.0.2 or FF02, double colon 2, all routers, all right? 
Uh, you can go out to, to Google um, and search. Let me just pull that up real quick. And you can search on well-known IPv4 multicast addresses. And you can see that actually in, when you get into the 224 space, let me make this a little smaller so it doesn't wrap around here. When you get into the 224 space, you can see that uh, all hosts, all systems, um, let me move this, let me make this a little bit smaller. Oh, I see what's going on here. Uh, let's see, it's gonna be cut off a little bit. Let me, let me just, trying to make sure it's in the recorded window here because I'm not recording the entire screen. Let's try that. There we go. All right. So you can see here as an example, um, 224001 is all systems, 224002 is all routers. Uh, and let's see, where is dot? It's weird. They're not, let me, let me sort these by number. There we go. I must have clicked one of those other columns. So here is uh, OSPF, all OSPF routers, all designated routers, uh, RIP version 2 routers, EIGRP routers, uh, and so on. But you'll notice here, and I, this is the most important aspect, is that if you look at the 224 block, right, um, all of the 224 blocks, blocks of addresses are reserved for well-known function, right? So you never want to pick, if you're doing some sort of multicast application, you never want to pick an address in the 224 block because they're already reserved for other functions in the network, all right? Uh, IGMP 22, uh, VRRP.18, and so on. So you want to make sure you avoid using any of the 224 addresses. In addition, all of the 224 addresses are link local. They have a link local scope. What does that mean when I say something has a link local scope? Any ideas? It means that it's not routable, that it has a time to live. In the case of IPv4, it has a time to live of one, uh, meaning that a, an, uh, uh, an OSPF multicast packet will not get routed beyond the next router because it has, a, by default, a time to live of one. Uh, so if I come out here to Google and I search on well-known IPv6 multicast addresses, uh, we can see uh, the same concept here and again we're going to notice that these addresses uh, fall within the FF range right FF01 all addresses FF01 all routers uh, and then um, let me sort by that column again all right there we go uh, let's see, why they go down to, oh, I know why, because of the scope. Uh, here we go, here's the FF02 ones. So all nodes, all routers, OSPF, OSPF designated routers, uh, RIP routers, EIGRP. So you can see here that essentially, whatever we're seeing in the case of IPv4, there's a direct correlation and a direct, ma a direct mapping to what's happening in IPv6. That's why, and hopefully you guys will feel the same way after we finish this class, but that's why I always tell my students, don't be scared of IPv6 because almost every fundamental, the fundamental theoretical concept that we learn in IPv4 is directly translatable in IPv6. We already saw that example when uh, we talked about summarization. Mathematically, the concept of summarization is exactly the same in IPv4 as it is in IPv6. Uh, that's, we just saw this also with the concept of, of multicast, right? Uh, FF, FF02 double colon A 
is all EIGRP routers. Well, that happened A is 10 in hexadecimal. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, though, is defining the scope, right? You'll see here that all nodes and all routers is FF01, whereas uh, EIGRP, OSPF, and, and whatnot are FF02. So all multicast addresses in IPv6 start with FF, but then we have these two other, well, these eight other bits, two nibbles, that are used for a specific purpose. And I saw a reference to that up here, which is the scope uh, and, um, and then whether it's a local or, let me see if they actually reference that here. Um, I don't think they reference it here. Uh, the, 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 this zero here is only used for one of two reasons. Either to define whether it's a well-known multicast address or whether it is a custom or a, uh, a multicast address that you configure, you know, for like your own multicast group or whatever. So obviously in this case, because these are all dogfight, that's awesome, uh, because these are all well-known and defined multicast addresses, they all start with FF0, all right? Now, you'll notice here that we see some, you know, uh, reserved addresses, FF3. Um, you'll probably never see the use of those in a real world, but you might see an FF1. FF1 would indicate that this is a group address that you're creating as an administrator. It's not a well-known or defined multicast address. And then finally, the last nibble represents the scope of the address. When I say scope, I mean, how far can this address be visible? How is it routed? How far can it reach? And that's what they're defining here in this table, all right? Interface local scope versus link local scope versus realm versus admin versus site versus organization versus global, all right? Now, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of each scope because that's kind of beyond the purpose of what we're talking about now but just think of a scope as the reachability of that particular packet right um, interface local and link local those simply reference that these are non-routable multicast packets they cannot be sent beyond a router uh, they're either going from hop hop to hop or they're or they're only switchable as opposed to routable Interface local means it's basically a switchable multicast packet, but it can't even go to the next router. Whereas the link local scope references that we can, we can send the traffic to the next router, but we can't send it beyond that next router uh, and, uh, and so on. So we have all these different soaps, uh, scopes that we can use. Uh, and you can go to RFC 4291 or RFC 7346 to kind of look at how those scopes are defined. All right, if, you, if you're interested in, in getting into that. So uh, just like, well, you guys will see this as, I, as I'm going through this material, I'm going to make an effort to try and expose you guys as much as possible to IPv6 uh, and not just kind of brush over it. I think it's an, a, an extremely important protocol to understand, a protocol stack. Uh, and um, I mean, I'm running IPv6 in my house uh, and IPv4, I'm actually doing dual stack, but uh, uh, you know, you'd be surprised. I mean, most internet, uh, most mainstream internet locations are IPv6 enabled. Uh, Think Tank, uh, my company's uh, web servers, for example, are already IPv6 enabled and so on. Speaking of IPv6, there are some different address uh, spaces that you need to be aware of. And I'm gonna go through a little demonstration here, and I think it's really important to understand this as well from the perspective of IPv6, even though we don't really get into too much detail on IPv6, I'm gonna get off track a little bit here. And, and again, quality, not quantity. We're, 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 our goal is to make sure that you guys get as much information out of this class as possible. So I wanna talk a little bit about the address allocation in IPv6. Uh, let me see if I can find a representation, IPv6 address allocation. Um, 
Now, let me see. Uh, reservations. Let me see if I can find the list. I believe this will show me that. Yep. Um, this is exactly what I was looking for. So you know how in IPv4, we essentially kind of derive the, the meaning of an IPv4 address based on the first octet. Uh, and we had classes back in the day in class A, class B, class C, class D, and class E, right? Class E was experimental, wasn't used. Class D is multicast. Class C used their 24-bit mask. Class B uses a 16-bit mask. Class A uses a, an 8-bit mask. And then within those classes, we had some reserved addresses. So the entire 127 block was reserved for loopback testing. All right, which means I could come out to my command prompt here and I can do a ping to essentially any 127 address. Let me try that again. My resolution is not matched up on my screen, so. Uh, so I can come out to my uh, PC here and I can do a ping to 127.0.0, oops, uh, off again, 0.0.1, .0 and, and I get a reply to that ping. Well, that tells me something, right? Specifically, it tells me that the protocol stack is working on this computer. Doesn't tell me that the interfaces are up and running. In fact, I don't even need interfaces to be turned on in order for this ping to work. But they reserved the entire block of addresses, 127 block, for the same purpose. 16.7 million addresses to do the exact same thing test the protocol stack on my computer. So when we talk about IPv4, we talk about, you know, the various reserved addresses. So 127 is reserved, and then we had 169.254.0.0 slash 16 was a link local scope, or what most people call a PIPA addresses, uh, or Microsoft anyway. Uh, and there's a bunch of others, right? There's a bunch of other addresses. 10.0.0.0 slash 8 is RFC 1918 address space in class A, which is private addressing. Uh, 172.16.0.0.12, as an example, slash 12, also RFC 1918 in the class, C, class B space. 192.168.0.0 slash 16, RFC 1918 in the, in the uh, class C space, and so on. All right. And then we have the 0.0.0.0 uh, .0 address. That's an unknown host. Uh, that's used uh, uh, in a lot of cases uh, for things like, say, DHCP, where I'm trying to find an address, but I don't have one. So I need to build a datagram anyway, and I need to put an address in the source field. Uh, so I'm going to put in a quad zero or 255, 255, 255, 255. Right, this is the all hosts broadcast. Uh, what people tend to call the local broadcast, but it's not a directed subnet broadcast in other words. This would be an address that might be used for like a DHCP discover message. Instead of, I'm, I'm trying to get an address, I don't even know what network I belong to, but I'm gonna go ahead and send out a discover. All right. Uh, so there's a bunch of addresses, but you'll notice here that essentially it really is the first octet that kind of defines the, the, the addresses. And I'll, I'll just throw one more thing in here. 0.0.0.0 uh, mathematically through 127.255.255.255 255 was traditionally class A. Uh, 128.0.0.0 through 191 255 255 was class B. 192.0.0.0 through 223.255.255 was class C. And then 224.0.0.0 through 239.255.255 was class D. And then finally, 2. 40.0.0.0 .0 .0 through 
255, 255, 255, 254 was class E. And then finally, the address 255, 255, 255 was reserved. All right. Uh, we don't use the class designations anymore, obviously, but uh, anyway, I'm just giving you some, a little bit of background. All right. Now, when it comes to IPv6, they did a similar thing. But in the case of IPv6, it wasn't the first octet that defined the reservation. It was the first hextet that defined the reservation. So we can see in this, in, in kind of the breakdown, we go from quad zero all the way up, and I guess you would probably guess this, to FF, um, well, in this case, FF00, right, slash eight. Uh, I did put a slash 16 before there. I meant to put a slash eight because each hexadecimal character is four bits. Sorry about that. So we were essentially going all the way from zero, zero, all the way up to FF. And every one of these blocks has a specific purpose. Now, reserved, 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 reserved. Guess what? None of those blocks are presently being used. All right. Now, it does say here within this block, uh, this 64-bit block is reserved for discard-only addresses. Uh, and then this particular block, 0200 double colon slash 7, deprecated as of 2004, was for, uh, per previously OSI NSAP mapped prefix set, which is a legacy protocol. So uh, essentially, those were allocated at some point for something else. Uh, but now they're just being simply held for a different reason. Here's why I kind of got off on this tangent, because you see that the very first block that's actually allocated is called the global unicast block. Uh, this is equivalent to public addressing. Whenever you see the term global in reference to an address, always think public, publicly routable, all right? And 2000 double colon slash three was, is, the, is the public presently the only address block that's being used for public IPv6. So what does that mean mathematically? 2000 double colon slash three. Well, the slash three is what we call my prefix. Remember this is prefix notation. We don't call it CIDR notation. Uh, because it doesn't have anything to do with classless interdomain routing. IPv6 has always been classless. So we call it prefix notation. It's basically the subnet mask. In IPv6, we use a, a prefix notation for the mask. We don't use hexadecimal or dotted decimal or anything like that. Well, if you do the math, 2000 in hex is 0010, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000. Each hexadecimal character is four bits, which is a nibble. And if I convert those that hexadecimal character to its equivalent decimal value, and then in turn convert that to its binary equivalent, then I get those values. All right. So uh, let's break that down even further. What does that mean from the perspective of what addresses fall within that range? Well, just like in IPv4, I mean, if I told you guys I have a 10.10.0.0 slash 16 network, you guys are programmed to probably recognize that that means that the first two octets are part of the network ID. The first 16 bits represent the network ID. Well, guess what? In IPv6, it means exactly the same thing. The first three bits represent the network ID. Okay? So in this case, these three bits are fixed, which means that the remaining bits can be anything. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, all right? Which means mathematically, the global unit cast range is 2,000 to 3 FFF. Because if this bit is a 1, then the value of this, hex, this hexadecimal character is a 3. If these bits are all 1s, then the value is an F, and so on. So as of right now, every public IPv6 address comes from here, from this range, globally. 
Now, if I go back, and again, this is really not the intent of this particular slide, but I, I, I am a, um, I, I don't just teach this stuff because it pays well. I teach this stuff because I just love talking about it, and I just love how everything just fits together. When you when you really truly learn how everything works, it it just all intertwines and it's really awesome how it all comes together. So if I come out here and I do an IPv4, well, actually before that, um, let me just show you one more thing. Regional Internet Registries. All right. So when it comes to uh, how addresses are assigned or allocated, uh, we deal with these things called Regional Internet Registries. There's five of them that exist. There's Aaron in the North America, there's Latin America, LACNIC, Africa, AFRINIC, Asian Pacific or APNIC, and then RIPE, which is the uh, uh, European uh, registry, okay? These guys, these five organizations, get addresses assigned to them by somebody called the IANA. And you've, you've seen already, uh, going through a couple of different searches here that the IANA is the one that publishes these particular lists, right? Uh, and the uh, formally delegated to the IANA um, and uh, you can see here IANA.org for address space and if I go back again to the IPv4 uh, same thing, we're looking at the IANA uh, address space. Well, that's the same multicast, but it, it's you get the idea. These are all addresses that are managed by the IANA, the Internet Numbers Assignment Authority. All right, IANA, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. That's what I meant to say. The Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They actually are responsible. They're the global organization that are responsible for handling any types of addresses that are handed out from a public perspective, MAC addresses port numbers for TCP, UDP, uh, BGP autonomous system numbers, um, protocol IDs like protocol 88 for AIGRP, protocol 1 for ICMP, anything that has to do with allocating numbers to protocols, to ports, to whatever is managed by this organization called the IANA. All right. Now if I come out here and I do IPv4 address allocation, all right, and I can take a look at the address space, right, it's called the address registry. Last updated on September 18th of 2018, all right, which obviously is pretty, pretty close to uh, what we are today. You can see here that all of the allocations were based on one simple principle the slash eight prefix. So this is network 36, this is network 37, network 38. And if I just keep scrolling through, I can go all the way up to 254, right? 254, future use, 253, future use. Of course, these will never be allocated because they, they fall within that experimental block. So actually, if I go back and I look at the last allocation, uh, that uh, of the allocatable address space 223 uh, that was allocated in April of 2010 all right and then these are the regional internet registries so this was assigned to APNIC this was assigned to RIPE this was assigned to Aaron uh, but the nice thing about this is if you go and scroll and and select the date the very first prefix was allocated in September of 1981 uh, and actually this was actually when the RFC was written so that's why we see that date but actually the very first prefix that was allocated from the public space was in 1991 so it was 10 years officially 10 years from the time that they they defined the scope of IPv4 to the time that an actual prefix was allocated. Now that's not to say that people weren't using the prefixes previous to that, because they certainly were, right? Um, I mean, routing existed prior to that, but 
The reality is not, not in a true modern sense. So if I go back down here and I, and I scroll all the way to the end, all right, this will tell you when the last prefix was assigned to a regional internet registry, 2011. That was the last time uh, a prefix was assigned uh, in IPv4. And you think about that and you say, well, that may, is that because they don't have any more? Or is that because they just decided to stop allocating them? And the reality is it's because they don't have any more. So it's been nearly, actually over seven years uh, that IPv4 address space was exhausted which is why IPv6 is so uh, prevalent now and why we use it so much. And that's not to say you can't get an IPv4 address or an IPv4 block uh, because the regional internet registries assign their addresses to service providers. And service providers can then subnet those prefixes and do with, with those prefixes what they choose to do, okay? Now, if I come back here and I do the same thing for IPv6, let me go back to my search window here. And I do IPv6 address allocation. It uh, was a completely different concept, all right? Because you'll look here and you'll actually see different prefixes. Slash 23, slash 23, 23, 23. There are some 20s, there's a 21, there's some 20. 22s, but you know what you're seeing commonly, uh, in fact, let me sort by the column here, by the date, what you're seeing commonly is that as I go down to the later dates, uh, well there was a slash 12 assigned in 2006, these guys don't count, 3FFE, uh, who is that assigned to, let me see, reserved uh, Teredo Tunneling, okay. Um, and then 5F00, that's also reserved. Uh, so the last IPv6 prefix was allocated in 2006. Wow. Um, quite, quite some time ago, actually. It's a little surprising. Um, I would have thought it would have been a little bit later than that. But it, it actually kind of makes sense that, it, that, it, that it's been 12 years. Um, See, there's a slash 12 that was assigned to RIPE, uh, a slash 12 assigned to Latin America, slash 12 to Aaron. Then we see a slash 12 here and a slash 23, a slash 23, slash 18. My point is um, that it looks a little bit random, although it's not. Uh, I, I believe that the modern approach is to go ahead and assign slash 12s to uh, regional internet registries, but previously it was let's go ahead and assign slash 23s. Um, so instead of just dealing with like the first two, uh, the first eight bits of a, of a hextet or even the first hextet altogether, we're actually allocating addresses based on you know, multiple bits. Let me explain what that means from the perspective of address space. And I, this is more of an exercise of uh, just pure interest and just to give you guys an idea of the scope of what we're dealing with uh, with IPv6. It certainly has nothing to do with what's going to be on the exam, but I think it's a really, really interesting concept. So when uh, the IANA decided that they were going to go ahead and start allocating IPv6 addresses, they, they decided to, and I, I do want to go ahead and use the previous method. Uh, let me do it this way. Slash 23, slash 32, slash 48. Let me see if I can pull up. Yeah, this is the diagram I was looking for. There's a couple of different approaches. Uh, we can see a slash 12 approach and we can see um, a slash 23 approach. Both of these were very common. Um, let me go ahead and use the, the slash 12 approach since it's more of a modern approach. This is the, uh, actually let me use this one. This is the one I usually use to demonstrate this concept. 
So when they, when they decided to go ahead and start allocating addresses, they said, you know what? Let's come up with a structured approach to allocating addresses to the regional internet registries uh, and then allow those, and then also define the approach that the regional internet registries are gonna use to assign address blocks to ISPs. And then uh, additionally, assign an approach on how ISPs are going to assign address blocks to customers. All right, and then what is the customer gonna do with those address blocks? And that's what we see here. That slash 23 is, is uh, what gets assigned to the registry. Slash 32 is what gets assigned to service providers. Slash 48 is what gets assigned to a customer. And slash 64 is the subnet prefix that the customer uses. Let me demonstrate what that means mathematically. So let's say any of you guys go for your organization, you go to your uh, ISP and you say, we wanna run IPv6. They're going to assign you most likely a slash 48. But let's say you're in, in Aaron. So the IANA has the entire block. They're going to assign address space to the regional internet registries using a slash 23, or it could be a slash 12. Mathemat I'm only going to do both examples, but you, you, you'll understand the concept mathematically when I go through this. Actually, slash, slash 12 is even a bigger range. Now, we already know that we're only assigning alloc or we're only allocating addresses from 2000 double colon slash 3. So to go from the IANA to a regional internet registry, we are using 20 bits to do that. Could be less if we're doing a slash 12, but I'm going to do this based on um, based on the slash 3 to a slash 23. All right. So if I do the math, pull over my calculator here. If I do the math, that's 2 to the power of 20. All right. Whoops. What did I do there? Let's try that again. Well, there it is right there. All right. So 2 to the power of 20, that's 1,048,500 uh, 576 networks. All right. 1,048,576 networks. All right. So far, so good. Doesn't seem like a whole lot when you consider the global scope. And it actually is even less if you go slash three to slash 12. But uh, eh, well, let's keep going with it, all right? The regional internet registries are then going to assign addresses to ISPs, all right? And that's gonna go from a slash 23 to a slash 32. And that's again based on this concept right here. Regardless of whether or not we're starting with a slash 12 or we're starting with a, uh, a uh, I just realized this slide's not in English. Oh, well, that's all right. We're not reading the, the, the table part. Uh, whether we're starting with a slash 12 or a slash 23, it doesn't matter because we're still going to a slash 32 for the ISPs. Now, that's only nine bits. So if I do two to the power of nine, uh, that's going to be equal to 512, right? Check my math because sometimes I make stupid mistakes. All right, to the power of 9 is equal to 512. So we're saying, okay, wait a minute. That means that we have 512 networks for the ISPs. Nope, because that's per the 1 million networks. All right. So if I multiply that times 1,048,576, that tells me that I have now, for the ISPs, this many subnets, okay? And I promise there's a reason for going through this. Uh, and main reason is for you guys to understand what the scope of IPv6 is, being that we're using a 128-bit address instead of a 32-bit address. It's not four times the size. It's exponentially different. Exponentially, all right? Uh, significantly different. So we go from 512 per 1 million gives us 536 million subnets for the ISPs. The ISPs, in turn, 
are going to be assigning addresses to customers, which would be you guys. That's going to go from a slash 32 down to a slash 48. So if you guys go request to IPv6, are any of you guys running IPv6 presently? Silence, I read no. Okay. All right. Just trying to keep you on your toes, asking questions. All right. So if I go from a slash 32 to a 48, that's 16 bits. That's 65,536 networks. Now you're starting to get a, 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 an idea of the scope per 5 million. 536 million, excuse me. So now if I take that number and I multiply that times 65,536, I get that many subnets. And uh, remember, this is just the 2000 block. What hasn't been allocated? What hasn't been allocated is the zero block, the one block, excuse me, the zero block, the um, four block. Uh, let, me, let me pull up the list here. All right. Basically, all those blocks that I showed you before. All right. Yeah, and I tell people that. Yeah, we'll never run out. I tell people that, and they say, yeah, they said that about IPv4. Well, it's true in this case, <laughs> right? IPv6 address reservations. So we still have the, uh, uh, the zero block if we choose to use it. We still have the, the one block, the two block, the four block, uh, the eight block, the 1,000 block. The 4,000 block, 6,000, 8,000, 8,000, C thousand, uh, all the way up to uh, to F8,000 or F8, F800. Every one of those blocks, and it, even if you just stop at C thousand, right? What I'm demonstrating right now is per each one of those blocks, right? So what is that? That's uh, that's million, billion, 35 trillion networks. 35 trillion networks around the globe. Now, how do you guys do address allocation inside your enterprise today? If you get an IPv4 block of addresses, particularly if it's public, you're very particular about how those blocks of addresses get assigned. Uh, if you have a network with 20 hosts, you're going to give it a slash uh, 26. Or if you have a a network with 112 hosts, you're going to get a slash 25. Or if you have a network with 500 hosts and whatever, you know, slash 22 and so on. So you're, you're going to essentially allocate. Now, the use of private addressing kind of makes it a little bit easier because you're not really necessarily concerned about conserving address space. But remember, we're talking about public address space. So you might be very particular about how you assign addresses in IPv4. In IPv6, we don't care because every network in the enterprise gets a slash 64. All right. Point to point serial link, give it a slash 64. A network with five hosts, give it a slash 64. A network with 100 hosts, give it a slash 64. Uh, which, by the way, is. Pull up my calculator again, 2 to the power of 64. Now, granted, I do have to subtract 1 because of the network ID, right? That's that many addresses per subnet. That many addresses per subnet. Why slash 64? Well, if you get a slash 48 from your ISP and you subnet down to a slash 64, that's 65,536 subnets from one prefix. From one of those 35 trillion prefixes, you can create 65,000 subnets. I would venture to guess that you've probably never seen a company's network that has more than 65,000 subnets. Um, now, there is another reason why slash 64 is used, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on. It's called the EUI 64 process, which 
legacy operating systems had to use to assign addresses to their to their to their hosts to the host itself, um, which ended up being a 64-bit address. All right. But the reality is, even though subnetting technically exists in IPv6, you're only subnetting the fourth hex tet, and it's basically subnet zero, subnet one, subnet two, subnet three, and every network uses a common mask, uh, which makes it a lot easier to allocate IPv6 address space in your enterprise. Just give every single network a slash 64. That's it. Every network gets a slash 64, um, which makes your life a heck of a lot easier okay well if you guys go back to your if you got AT&T or Spectrum or whatever and you go back to your carrier and say hey I want I want to run IPv6 in my house you know how does it work in IPv4 they give you a single public address on your router and you run private addressing internally and you NAT everything to those private addresses right uh, you NAT all the private addresses to that public address excuse me using port address translation Guess what you're going to get in IPv6 slash 64? Your service provider is going to provide you a slash 64 prefix, which means you're going to have that 18, whatever the heck that number is. What is that? Uh, million, billion, trillion, quadrillion. What is five? I don't know. It's a lot, right? So uh, for this reason, uh, and this has gone a little bit further than I wanted to go, but for this reason, uh, IPv6 is, is, is being deployed as a globally routable solution, which means the concept of private addressing doesn't exist. I mean, technically it does exist. There is an address block that's reserved for private addressing. We can see it right here, unique local unicast. Uh, unique local unicast is equivalent to um, equivalent to private RFC 1918 addresses in IPv4, um, and uh, uh, it's even though it is defined, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's been deprecated. But most people that choose to implement IPv6 uh, like to keep it natively routable globally. So they're not doing that. They're not. They don't have a NAT boundary. Uh, and then the next question I always get: Well, doesn't that make me more vulnerable from a security perspective? Uh, and the answer is no. I mean, we have I, we have customers today that are running public IPv4 addresses inside their network, and they're no more vulnerable uh, than customers that are running RFC 1918 address space because they have firewalls. They have access control rules, they have policies that restrict, uh, you know, gaining access to the network without that access being explicitly permitted or, you know, some sort of reflexive access based on connections that were initiated from the inside going out. All right. So you can see here that as far as the address blocks go in IPv6, there's not a whole lot going on. We've got our multicast block. We've got this, this link scoped unicast block, uh, and then we've got some more reserved blocks, and then the, the unique local unicast. This, is, this block here has actually officially been deprecated. So really when it comes down to it, we have essentially some very basic reserved address space. Now, this doesn't give us the complete picture because there's stuff that's reserved for uh, uh, six to four translation and some other processes that exist. Here's the here's the, the blocks that are reserved. Double colon one is reserved for the loop back. So instead of the entire 127 block, it's just simply double colon one. And that allows me to test the protocol stack on my computer. Uh, double colon slash 128 is unknown host. Double colon just represents a bunch of zeros. Uh, so this happens to be all zeros. And then this is... Uh, a double colon FFFF colon zero colon zero slash 96 is for IPv4 mapped addresses uh, slash 96 deprecated uh, the well-known prefix used in algorithmic mapping. So there are some blocks and you don't need to know this by any means. There are some blocks that are reserved for specific purposes. 
All right. Um, and uh, obviously these blocks cannot be used. Uh, some of them come from the global, global unicast range. In fact, all of these here come from the global unicast range. 2001, 2001, 2001, 2001, 2001. So uh, all of these were, were allocated within the global unicast range for special purposes. In fact, just about every one of these. Yeah, all of these. Um, here's the one for six to four tunneling, 2002 double colon slash 16. Um, most of these are deprecated. Yes, sir. Well, so that's an interesting question. And if uh, the people on the, uh, you guys, I, for some reason, my audio is not very loud. I don't know why when I'm listening to you guys, but uh, I'll repeat the question for the folks that are going to watch the video here. Uh, he, he asked the question, if, I, if, we, if we purchased a slash 23 from an IPv4 address space perspective from an ISP or whatever, uh, would have to have been an ISP, um, and that cost is X amount of dollars, would it be less expensive for me to go ahead and purchase IPv6? Uh, so let me, uh, the same, well, you would never be able to get a slash 23 uh, in IPv6 space, but you really wouldn't need one, obviously, because of the amount of address space that you get. Uh, that's another concept within IPv6 is they restrict who gets those big blocks. And not only do they restrict who gets the big blocks, they also force you to, to either allocate or use those blocks. So an ISP can't just sit on a bunch of IPv6 address space. They actually have to allocate a percentage of that address space every year. And if they don't, they lose that address space. So uh, they can't just sit on it. But let me, uh, let me answer your question. So the reality is that you're actually technically not purchasing the address space, right? Um, because address space is not for sale. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a commodity that can be bought and sold. Uh, you're purchasing the right to use it, and you're purchasing its manageability. So to answer your question, the cost would probably be the same because you're not paying for the actual address space. You're paying the service provider for managing that address space for you and routing that address space to you and so on. Does that make sense? Now, yeah, it does. Uh, you know, I, I'd have to. I think I'd have to actually see the bill sheet, right, from the, from the provider to see are, are they are they charging more uh, you know, for a twenty three versus a, a twenty four. Right. Uh, then it's, cause it, right. Because you said by default they're giving you a what? A sixty four in the two thousand block. Forty eight. Four, sorry, forty eight in the two thousand. Block. Yeah, which means. Uh, mathematically, that means that if I do 128 minus 48, that means you have 80 bits to play with. So uh, you don't have to subnet down to 64. You can go beyond 64. But if I do 2 to the power of 80, uh, that's essentially how many addresses you're actually getting, public addresses, right? And how you decide to subnet that. Everybody decides on slash 64 because of the EUI 64 process, but you're not restricted to slash 64. If you're using legacy equipment, you're, that's going to require it. But you can go to slash 80, you, I mean, uh, slash 100, slash whatever, right? Hey, so uh, talk to me about this real quick. Uh, so we have uh, a set of uh, public IP addresses that we can only use on at &T. And so um, we went out and purchased another block of IP addresses that we can use on any provider. Right? So can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yes, I can. So it's, it's, yeah, AT and T, you know, they have the, the right to use uh, a certain block, but there are other blocks that anybody can use. Well, it, it's a matter of of you becoming the service provider or the service provider giving you addresses that they're providing services for, right? Okay. Um, and so, in, in in the case where you're you're assigned a block, you're getting that block from the IANA right? Or you're getting that block from a regional internet registry. Uh, so you're circumventing the ISP. And essentially, in that case, you've become the ISP. You're going to use BGP, you're going to advertise that block through BGP. And then uh, people on the internet 
are going to are going to then in turn re-advertise that block to the to their partners and their peers but you become the host for that subnet that network whereas yeah, that's, exactly, that's exactly what we did we, we had a contact ISP so they allowed it through their network and then we just had to advertise it exactly so the the difference is whether you know if when you buy it when you when you lease a block of addresses from a service provider they own those addresses they've been allocated to that service provider and they're advertising them to or they're 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 routing those packets to you but they're also advertising the that network to everybody else the only difference is in the case where where the anybody can route it's just you just own that block and it's not you're getting that block directly from the regional internet registry which uh Yep, and it would have to be set up in your peering agreement between the, you're going to have your BGP peering relationship with your ISP, and you're going to advertise that uh, that network to your ISP, and then you're going to say, look, we're we're the we're the owner of this block, doesn't belong to anybody else, and uh, and can you please go ahead and make sure that you incorporate this into your BGP routing table and and so on, right? You have it on what? I'm sorry. Right. So you're advertising it in, in, yeah, in BGP to both your carriers. Exactly. But then you also have to make sure that you don't become a transit AS, right? You want to make sure that you have the appropriate filtering in place so that you're not routing traffic for the internet. So, yeah. Right. I'm curious, when did you get that address block assigned? Just last year, really. Hmm. And there were just stipulations, like you said, we had to, we had X amount of days to advertise it, X amount of days to at least have one post or you know, something. You know, right. Using it. Yeah, I'm just surprised. And that was in IPv4 space, not IPv6. Yeah. Hmm. Or, yeah, slash Interesting. Well, we, have the 20, we have the 24 split between data centers and then we're we're advertising the 23 to both interesting yeah um yeah so so when it, when i do ipv4 address allocation you know the one thing that we don't see now actually let me do this uh let me do um uh aaron address allocation Yeah, you would have if it was in the United States. Um, uh, let's see. Well, see, here's a fee schedule for Aaron. Interesting. Um, that's probably just. Uh, yeah. So, so they do have service categories and fees. Um, so this is maybe what like a uh, service provider might pay or what you guys are probably paying. So if it's larger than 22 up to 20, you're going to pay $1,000 a year. Uh, if it's larger than slash 20 and up to slash 18, $2,000 a year and so on. Now the service providers might tack on some additional fees, um, but a slash eight or a slash six, uh, up to a slash six, that's 128,000. 256,000 a year for a slash six. Uh, interesting. Um, but uh, what I wanted to see was the actual allocation. Uh, let's see. Here it is. Now that's INA. I want to see. Uh, let me do this address registry. I don't know if they actually publish it. They might keep it private. I was going to see if I could see a similar list for the uh, allocations, um, but they might they might keep it private. I mean, I would imagine that they'd want to probably keep it private. Not that you couldn't do a lookup and find out who owns what, but uh, 
Um, you know, this is an interesting document to read too, Internet Governance. It talks about, you know, uh, what, what is the nature of the Internet and how is it supposed to be shared and resources are supposed to be shared and so on. But, so anyway, that was the first bullet point. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of information, obviously, but I think it's really valuable information. Actually, we kind of talked about everything on this, on this slide here, um, except for Link Local. And I, I want to definitely demonstrate something about Link Local real quick. So what I've got here is I just pulled up a little router in GNS3. I wanted to demonstrate this concept of Link Local communication because it's completely different than what we see in the concept of Link Local with IPv4. Typically speaking, when you get a Link Local address in IPv4, it means that you just can't communicate because it's, a, it's an APIPA address that's used by diskless workstations to boot and so on. So let's say that I uh, come in here, interface loopback zero. Uh, actually, let me before I do that, let me turn on IPv6 routing. We use the IPv6 unicast uh, dash routing command to do that. All right, that's what enables uh, IPv6 routing. Uh, and then if I go into, uh, well, actually, I don't even need to do anything else. Uh, well, I do. Let me turn on my interfaces. So, oops. Uh, do show IP interface brief. Uh, let's do Ethernet 1211213. So interface, Ethernet 11, no shut. 12, no shut. 13, no shut. All right. So all I've done is I've turned on three of my interfaces and I've enabled IPv6 routing on the router. If I do a Show IPv6 interface brief. Oops. Show IPv6 interface brief. You can see here that uh, I have essentially three interfaces that are turned on, but nothing is happening with IPv6. Now, if I do a show IPv6 protocols, and we'll look at all these commands later on as well, I can see that IPv6 routing is running. And we're just working with connected networks right now. We're not running EIGRP or OSPF or anything like that. So if I go into interface, interface Ethernet 1.1 and do IPv6 enable, interface Ethernet 1.2, IPv6 enable, interface Ethernet 1.3, IPv6 enable. Now if I do a show IPv6 interface brief, you will notice that each interface has an IPv6 address. And uh, that is what we call a link local address. Every IPv6 enabled interface on any device, iPhone, router, SVI on a switch, whatever, is gonna generate something called a link local address. This link local address plays a huge role in IPv6. It's one of the most important addresses that you're gonna see in IPv6. It's used for neighbor discovery. So we don't have ARP in IPv6. We have something called ICMP neighbor discovery. It's used for router advertisements for stateless auto configuration. It's used as the next top IP address for routes in the routing table. It's used for neighbor relationships in OSPF and EIGRP and BGP. It's used for everything, all right? I didn't assign those link local addresses. They were self-derived from the EUI64 process. So if I do a show interface uh, and I include a BIA, all right, we can see all of the MAC addresses that are assigned to these interfaces. So there's uh, one Charlie, one Delta, one Echo. Well, guess what? There's one Delta, there's one Echo, and there's probably a Foxtrot here as well. There's a one Foxtrot. So these are the three interfaces that we're talking about. Ethernet 111213. All right, you're gonna see a very similar concept here. First of all, all link local addresses that are automatically derived start with FE80 double colon slash 10. All right. Now, if I do the math, FE80 double colon slash 10 is more than just FE80. FE80 double colon slash 10. 
So Fe is going to be fixed. And then we have two more bits that are fixed. Well, if I to convert 8 to binary, that is 1000. Zero, zero, zero. So actually, it's just these first two bits. Let me delete that there. Uh, and then finally, 0000. zero, zero, zero. So this is the hexadecimal portion. And this is the last two hexadecimal characters in binary. So a slash 10 means that technically, link local addresses can fall anywhere from FE80 to what? Well, if this is a 1, 1, and this is a 1, 1, 1, technically, FE what? Anybody? Got to do a little bit of math in your head, right? So it's 8, 9, 10, 11. So that's Bravo Foxtrot, right? So mathematically, that's what we're talking about, link local. Okay. However, in the case of automatically derived link local addresses, they always start with FE80, always. All right. In fact, the, the middle 54 bits are always fixed at zero. So this link local address plays a very significant role in, in uh, how this router communicates over that interface. Uh, so let's take this address as an example. All right, here's how the uh, process works. This is a 48-bit address. By the way, what I'm describing here is something called the EUI64 process. All right, uh, and I take that 48-bit address and I drop in an FFE, FFFE in the middle, CA019 Bravo FFFE. 44011 delta. So now, uh, this looks a little confusing. Let me move that over. So now this is a 64 bit address, which is why it's called the EUI 64 bit process, because we're converting a 48 bit MAC address into a 64 bit hexades hexadecimal address. All right? The next step is to invert the seventh bit. All right, so Charlie, Charlie is what in binary? So it's 12, which is 1100, zero, zero. and then alpha is 10, which is 1010. Zero, zero. So if I invert the seventh bit, that becomes 1100, zero, zero, 1000, zero, zero, which equals Charlie 8. Make sense? There's a reason why we invert that seventh bit. It has to do with whether the address is globally unique or locally unique. But uh, in, in any event, you always invert that seventh bit. That is the two-step process to creating this link local address, which becomes FE80 double colon, uh, in this case, C8 uh, 01 colon 9 Bravo FF colon FE do 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 four four colon one one delta. All right. Now if I come back here and I copy my address, I get an extra one in there. I think I got an extra one in there. Did I get an extra one? Uh, I did get an extra one. Sorry about that. It's zero, zero, and I put an extra one, all right? So this becomes the link local address, all right? Um, there's a reason why this process is used. Uh, first of all, link local addresses have to be um, only unique within the subnet. We say link local, but technically because we're talking about a router, we're talking about within the broadcast domain. So link local addresses are not routable. All right, they're, they're used for local communication within the subnet. Uh, and um, that's essentially what the process is. For me though, because these link local addresses show up everywhere, 
I hate these EUI 64 addresses. I, I, it, I mean, how can you look at that address and know what its function is or what router it's tied to and so on? So for me, as a, you know, as a personal preference, when I'm configuring IPv6 in a production environment, I like to statically configure my link local addresses because, um, you know, I can make it something that I recognize, oh, that's router five because of its link local address. All right. Um, Well, it, so the question is: Is it is it is it uh, local link local because so that means that somebody else can can generate the same address somewhere else as long as it's not within the same subnet? And the answer is no. the 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 reason it's link local is because of its purpose. The function of a link local address is to only provide services within the local domain, within the local routing broadcast domain. Um, there's nothing that a link local address is used for beyond the scope of the subnet itself. Uh, so it just becomes automatically just a non-routable address. Uh, now, that being said, that makes our life a little bit simpler because I can come into my router now and I can say, you know what, I don't like those link local addresses. Oh, and by the way, let me go ahead and just interface serial 2.0, no shut. IPv6 enable, do show IPv6 interface brief, you will notice this guy grabbed an address which would have been, uh, let me do 2.1 so I can demonstrate this, serial 2.1, no shut, IPv6 enable, do show IPv6 interface brief. Uh, so you'll see it's assigning the same address to both interfaces. Well, that's because serial interfaces don't actually have a MAC address. So there's no way to derive a, a unique link local address for that interface. So what it's doing is it's borrowing a MAC address, uh, do show interface. It's borrowing a MAC address from another interface. I think it's, I think it's a fast ethernet interface, if I'm not mistaken. You see FE4400, yeah, right here, FE4400, so 019 Bravo, yeah, 019 Bravo. So that's exactly what's happening. It's using the, the MAC address on the fast Ethernet interface, and I'm not sure if it's just simply using that because it's the lowest one or if it's fast Ethernet, whatever happens to be the quote-unquote first address. But the fact that two interfaces have the same link local address doesn't matter because they're not routed. So if one serial interface is using a link local address and another serial interface is using the same link local address, it, there's no conflict there. So for me, it's just better just to simply go into my interface and say IPv6 address uh, FE80. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I can use, and this is where the, the range comes into play. I could technically use this as part of the address so let's do that just to prove a point. All right, double colon, and I could say, oh, this is router five in building one, um, and just put link local, All right? So I can assign my own link local address, and I could do that, that same address on every interface. The only restriction is that the link local address needs to be unique within the broadcast domain, all right? Uh, and to me, that's a much easier address to recognize. Maybe not that one specifically, but you get the idea is that I'm, I'm uh, creating an address that's easy to manage and easy to understand. And because this shows up in, in everything in IPv6, EIGRP neighbor table, EIGRP topology table, routing table, etc., these link local addresses show up everywhere. It's really important to make sure that these link local addresses are something that you can easily recognize. All right, does that make sense? So we'll get into more of this stuff a little bit later on. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously we just spent an hour on one slide, but uh, there's a lot to talk about with IPv6. And uh, 
unfortunately, when it comes to the book, uh, that's about it. They give you, uh, <laughs> they give you one type, uh, one, one slide, uh, and then make the assumption that you, you know everything else. So I'm trying not to do that in this case. All right. So, so what you're seeing on this slide here is just kind of a representation of what we call network types. Uh, and when we get into each of the protocols in more detail, we'll get into more uh, detail specifically about these network types. But uh, a point-to-point -point network, basically it's just any type of network that's going to connect two routers using a point-to-point -point protocol. That's very important to understand here. And, uh, just because you might have two routers connected with Ethernet does not uh, directly with a crossover cable does not necessarily make that a point-to-point -point network. Uh, Ethernet is a broadcast-based protocol, so the routers are still going to interpret that as a broadcast network, even though there might not be a switch involved. The router doesn't know if there's a switch or if there's no switch. It just simply looks at the network type. So when we talk about point-to-point, -point, we're talking about typically a serial link, although it doesn't have to be. It could be Ethernet running PPPoE. But it is any kind of link that might be running um, a point-to-point uh, -point encapsulation, like HDLC, like, um, uh, like PPP, uh, like Frame Relay can be implemented as point-to-point. -point. Uh, so there, there are many options with regard to point-to-point. To -point, all right. A broadcast network is a uh, any network where you have multiple clients that share a common subnet uh, where you can actually send a single message to all participants in that network uh, by using a broad directed broadcast packet or an all host broadcast packet or whatever all right uh, and then you have something called an nbma network now, that's a little confusing this concept of nbma Frame Relay, X25, ATM, Asynchronous Transfer Mode. These are all examples of an NBMA network. NBMA stands for Non-Broadcast Multi-Access, uh, which is a little bit confusing because Frame Relay does support broadcasting. Uh, it, just, it, it just depends on how the service provider chooses to implement the backend architecture. Uh, so Frame Relay can be configured and deployed as a non-broadcast type of uh, network, but it can also de be deployed in a broadcast type scenario. So uh, just, it's a little confusing, but here's the key, all right? Traditionally, a non-broadcast multi-access network is any network that doesn't have the capability of supporting broadcasts. And then you might think, well, that's not a big deal because we don't generally like broadcasts. But here's the key to that. It also means that we don't even have the capability of supporting multicast. And that is a big detriment to our dynamic routing protocols because a lot of times these dynamic routing protocols use multicast to form adjacencies uh, with their hello packets and so on. Um, so that's a, that's a concern. And, and when we get to each of the routing protocols individually, we'll talk about that concept. All right. Now, as far as an MBMA topology goes, this switch in the middle represents an ATM switch or a, or a, uh, a frame relay switch. These NBMA topologies can be deployed in what we call a point to multipoint environment, uh, which is what we call a hub and spoke environment, or they can be deployed in a point to point environment. What we're seeing here is point to multipoint. We can tell it's point to multipoint for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is the points, this is the this is the multipoint side, and these are the point sides on the right. But you'll notice here it is still a common subnet. Every one of these interfaces share a common subnet: 10112, 10116, 10110, and so on. Some of the considerations, and again, when we get into the protocol specifically, we'll get into more detail on this. But some of the considerations that you have to take into account when you're dealing with this are things like split horizon. 
this routing update from, we'll call it router one on the right, comes in to serial 000 on the left router. Well, by definition, especially with EIGRP, we have something called split horizon. It's actually any distance vector routing protocol, but EIGRP is really the only one we use today. So with EIGRP, we have a, a rule called uh, a split horizon rule, which states never advertise a network, back out the same interface that the network was learned on, which means that to 10112, the network behind 10112 gets advertised to the router on the left, but the router on the left will never advertise that network back out to the router of 10116 or 10110 because that breaks the split horizon rule. All right. Now we also may have issues with neighbor discovery. Because this is non-broadcast, neighbor discovery, which is done using multicast, won't work over a non-broadcast network. So neighbors are not automatically discovered. You can statically configure neighbors. I'll show you guys that a little bit later on, but that's gonna mean that you're gonna also have to specify who's gonna be the DR. Uh, but here's the problem. OSPF treats NBMA networks by default like their Ethernet networks. So it makes the assumption that we can form neighbor discoveries and it breaks, doesn't work. All right. Uh, and then we also have issues potentially with, with um, broadcast replication and flooding of traffic through the network. Now there's a couple ways we can handle these characteristics. We can use sub interfaces, for example, and logically separate all of our subnets. So now you can see this is 10.1.1.2 slash 30, 10.1.1.6 slash 30, 10.1.1.10 slash 30. So these are, these drawings are horrible, by the way. Uh, they don't really depict what's going on here, but uh, there's supposed to be three red lines over here, each of them representing a sub interface. But essentially what we did is we took this single broadcast domain and we logically divided it up into three different broadcast domains using sub interfaces, which solves our split horizon issue because the networks that get advertised from 10.1.1.2 come in in serial 000.1. Well, they can get advertised back out of serial 000.2 and 0.3 because those are logically different interfaces. So there's, there's a couple of different ways that we can handle dealing with these non-broadcast multi-access networks. And, and like I said, we'll, we'll get into um, some of those solutions uh, a little bit later on. All right. Although frame relay is not really something that we concern ourselves with too much in modern networks, uh, it's still still somewhat prevalent in a lot of the material. So we're going to have to uh, kind of discuss how we manage that process. All right. Hey Scott, real quick. Yes, sir. neighborship with I select broadcast and the interface type um, which, which I guess makes sense but if I only have one router I'm doing that neighborship uh, with I, I select point PTP point to point right right so that seems to suggest it's the number of routers you're talking to not necessarily the protocol well there's there's two factors that get affected there and I and we will see this when we get into OSPF OSPF recognizes essentially in the Cisco world five different network types point to point point to multipoint, point to multipoint non-broadcast, non-broadcast, and broadcast. So every one of those five network types has, there's two caveats that you have to concern yourself with when you're dealing with OSPF. Is there automatic neighbor discovery? And any network type that doesn't have the word, that excuse me, any network type that has the word non-broadcast automatic neighbor discovery is not allowed. So in the case of point to point and broadcast, both of those allow for automatic neighbor discovery. And then secondarily, how are, how are elections done? Are we doing a DR BDR election? And point to anything, there is no DR BDR election. Anything that's not point to anything, there is a DR BDR election. So in a, in a multi-access network where you have potentially more than one host, uh, more than two hosts, excuse me, you want to set that to broadcast because you want that DR-BDR election to take place. 
Uh, whereas on a point-to-point -point link, there's no need to do a DRBDR election because there's no way to reduce the number of adjacencies that you have on a point-to-point -point link. Um, I don't. That probably doesn't answer your question because there's a lot of back backstory to that uh, that we need to get into. But I'm going to defer that to the OSPF lessons, okay? Because we do talk about those concepts uh, specific to OSPF and some of the considerations that you have to take into account when you're working with OSPF. Um, I, I'm not trying to circumvent answering the question. I think uh, it's something that will be answered. Um, but uh, so if you don't, if it's not completely clear, it will become clear. Okay, does that make sense? No problem, all right. Um, all right. So what about connecting over the internet? Right. Obviously, the the challenge with with routing over the internet is we don't control it. Right. The internet is it, it, it is can provide transport. It has reachability, but there's no security. Uh, there's no quality of service. Uh, and there's no way to really truly form adjacencies between routers over the internet because they're multiple routers apart. And adjacencies need to occur in a layer two domain, right? In a broadcast domain. So, uh, and then we have the whole issue of am I doing private addressing or public addressing and so on. So what do we do? Well, we come up with something like a VPN. And in the next lesson, we're going to talk about the different VPN technologies that allow us interconnectivity. There's a bunch of them. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to focus on three different types, uh, maybe four, a little bit on the fourth one. IPsec, traditional IPsec VPNs. Uh, we're using the IPsec framework uh, with ESP and AH and message integrity and authentication and encryption and confidentiality and all that. Um, or uh, service provider managed VPNs like MPLS, multi-protocol label switching, or finally, um, enterprise managed VPNs, where you manage the VPN over a public domain. That could be like a Flex VPN, a Get VPN, a DM VPN, Easy VPN. There's a whole bunch of different types of VPNs. We're going to talk primarily about DM VPN, which is the dynamic multi-point VPN solution. Okay. So finally, that concludes that lesson, only an hour and a half on that one, but uh, that's the second lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to get into those VPN solutions that I talked about. Specifically, we're going to talk about MPLS, what's a layer 2 MPLS, what's a layer 3 MPLS, what is uh, VPLS versus VT VPWS. Uh, we'll talk about GRE, generic route encapsulation. We'll talk about uh, DMVPN, multipoint GRE, and we'll wrap up our discussion talking about uh, next top re uh, resolution protocol, NHRP. And then finally, what is the role of IPsec in DMVPN, which allows us to provide um, that confidentiality and authentication and integrity that we need for a robust VPN solution. So we'll take a break and we'll see you guys back here in about 15 minutes where we're going to go into the next lesson.